In this video, we'll investigate how list recovery works out for Reed Solomon codes. So remember that in the list recovery problem, we are given a bunch of lists S1 through Sn of size at most little l, and we want to define all of the code words in some code so that the ith symbol of the code word lives in the ith list for most of the lists. If we translate that to Reed Solomon codes, it says that we should have a bunch of lists so that the number of low degree polynomials whose evaluations at particular points lie in the corresponding list for most of the lists is not too large. More precisely, we have the following problem. Let's fix some distinct evaluation points, alpha 1 through alpha n in fq. And suppose we are given lists s1 through sn, which are subsets of fq, so that each has size at most little l. Then our goal in the list recovery problem when specialized to read Solomon codes is to find all polynomials f over fq in some variable x that have degree at most k minus 1, and so that f of alpha i lives in the list si for all but p times n values of i. If that's true, then the corresponding Reed Solomon code is p, comma, little l, comma, the number of such polynomials list recoverable. Our problem is to do this efficiently, let's say ideally in time polynomial in n, and notice that that's going to imply that capital L, the number of such polynomials, must also be polynomial in n, because otherwise we wouldn't have time to output them all. We can draw a picture of this problem as follows. So down here on the x-axis, I'm going to draw fq, and on the y-axis, this is also fq, and I'm going to imagine like you know, plotting a polynomial as though this were the evaluation points, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and so on. And let's just pretend it makes sense to lay fq out on a line like this. Of course it does not. And now for each evaluation point, we have a set si of possible values that a polynomial could take at that evaluation point. So for example, if little l were equal to 2, maybe my values would look like this. That is, if we were to plot some polynomial, you know, like this or something like that, where here are the inputs and here are the outputs, again, pretending that fq can be written on a line in a reasonable way, we would want to find all the polynomials that go through lots of these points. For example, here are some quadratic polynomials that go through some but not all of these points. Once again, just pretending that it makes sense to plot fq by fq as though we're the, we're the reals. Okay, so that's our problem. We're given some possible values for each evaluation point. We want to find all the polynomials that go through enough of those points, and we want to do it efficiently. How are we going to do this? I claim we actually already have the answer. So pause the video now and think about it. How would you do this efficiently? The answer is the Guraswami Sudan algorithm. In particular, in a previous video, we proved this theorem. Suppose we have a bunch of points, alpha i comma y i, for i between 1 and capital M, and fix a parameter r that's greater than or equal to 1. Then there is an efficient algorithm, the Guraswami Sudan algorithm, that returns all polynomials f of x over fq, so that the degree of f is at most k minus 1, and so that f of alpha i is equal to y i for lots of different i's. And if you look back to that video, lots of different i's meant this many i's, the square root of m times k times 1 plus 1 over r. Moreover, we showed that there were not so many such polynomials, at most r times the square root of m over k. Okay, so this theorem looks a little bit different than it did when we stated it before. The only difference is that this thing here, I've all of a sudden started calling capital M, when we used to be calling it n. However, you can go back and check that if you just change all of the n's to a capital M, in fact, nothing changes. The important thing about getting to rename n to some capital M, anything we want, is that capital M can actually be larger than n. In particular, these alpha i's here don't need to be distinct. Okay, so what does this have to do with list recovery? 
Well, I claim that it immediately gives us the following corollary. So I've copied the theorem down here, and here's a corollary. The corollary says that a Reed-Solomon code over fq of length n and dimension k is efficiently p comma little l comma big L list recoverable, that is, it solves that interpolation problem that we saw on a previous slide, provided that p is not too large, smaller than 1 minus the square root of r times l times 1 plus epsilon for some parameter epsilon. Sorry, I should have written let epsilon be greater than 0 at the beginning. There we go. And the list size can be big O of 1 over epsilon times the square root of L divided by R. Let's look at this radius P here. Let's let epsilon go to zero, so let's just ignore that basically. So then this says that P can be all the way up to one minus the square root of R times L. This should look a lot like the Johnson bound. For list decoding, the Johnson bound says that the list decoding radius can be as large as one minus the square root of R. And here what we're doing is we're throwing an L in under the square root. This turns out to be the analogous statement of the Johnson bound for list recovery. Also notice that the list size here is something reasonable. You might be a little bit worried because I said earlier that capital L needed to be larger than little l, and here it looks like it scales with the square root of little l, which is a bit concerning. But notice that this condition here means that the rate r has to be at most 1 over little l in order for this to give you a non-trivial result. So that means that this square root of L over R is at least the square root of L squared, so indeed this does scale uh, linearly with L like it's supposed to. Okay, so that's this corollary. Let's prove it real quick. Suppose we're given input lists S1 through Sn. So let's say that Si is equal to Yi1, Yi2, dot to dot up to Yi L for all i in n. Then, in order to use this theorem, we're going to let capital N be little l times n, and we're going to form little l times n tuples of the form alpha i comma y i, where we're going to repeat each alpha i l times for each of its corresponding different y's. So we'll take alpha 1, y1, 1, alpha 1, y1, 2, dot, 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 all the way up to alpha 1, y1, l. And then we'll take alpha 2, y2, 1, and so on. All the way up to alpha n, y, n, l. Then we are going to apply this theorem with those tuples and with r equal to 1 over epsilon. In order for that to work, we're going to need 1 minus p to be less than this agreement normalized by n. So that's 1 over n times the square root of m times k times 1 plus 1 over r, which plugging in our definition of capital M and r is 1 over n times the square root of n times l little l times k times 1 plus epsilon and then pulling this n inside the square root. That becomes equal to capital R, the rate, times little l, times 1 plus epsilon, all under the square root. And that's exactly what we got here, uh, once we move this 1 over to the other side. Great, so we've established that Reed-Solomon codes are efficiently list recoverable up to some list recovery version of the Johnson bound. That's cool. You might be wondering, though, why do we care? It turns out that list recovery has tons of applications. In the next few videos, we'll see one such application to streaming algorithms.